Wonderful. Well, uh, as we've done, we did one of these a few weeks ago or a month ago or so, and uh, we're going to put my number up just so we did that night because we want it to be a conversation for all of us. I've got some questions just to kick things off. And uh, somebody came up to me um, after last time and said, great, thanks for your number. If I have any questions, I'll just text you. This isn't a general hotline for any questions that you've got. Uh, this is specifically for this evening. You're welcome to have my number, but I will not answer your generic questions at any point in your life that you need an, a question answering. Uh, so if there's something that somebody talks about and you think, I would love to know a little bit more, push that point or just understand that a bit more, please text me and uh, I'll try and sift through those questions and it'll help us along our way. You know, we started the series uh, talking about the table of decision when Mary um, broke that perfume over Jesus' feet and poured it over Jesus' feet, anointed him for his death, but it was an act of, of worship. And uh, Ian kicked off that. Before we do that, let's introduce ourselves. Here I am going straight in. You may not know who these guys are. So you want to say your name and um, what you do, something like that. And um, why don't you just in a line, uh, just in a line, not a full testimony, but give us how you began the Calvary Road, how you began on that road to the cross. What was it that brought you to Jesus? Just, just in one line, okay? Good luck. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Mary and I am a student, actually. So um, in my final year now and in a line how I came onto the Calvary Road. I said a prayer at six years old, but I would say my journey, intensity of the Calvary Road started when I came to this church, just before I came to this church. So in my first degree, about 19 years old. Hey, uh, I'm Simon. Uh, I'm, what am I? I'm a worship leader. <laughs> uh, and uh, I got saved when I was 11 years old, brought up in a Christian home. Uh, and so from the age of 7 to 19, I was in a church, um, which maximum had 20 people. Um, my youth group was three people maximum, myself, my brother, and one other person. Um, gave my heart to the Lord when I was 11. And then when I came here, when I was 20, I was like, wow, this church is huge. It's like, it's got 50 people in it. <laughs> so yeah, that's me. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a student at RGU, a third year student. Um, and how I got saved is kind of a weird question, but um, I suppose I gave my life to God probably about a hundred times in the space of two years because um, I wasn't sure really how to do it properly. Um, but it was kind of, I suppose, officially in a tent mission in the middle of Northern Ireland um, in a wee field. Um, and I was sitting there and it was kind of the first time I realized that it wasn't a decision that my parents made um, or anything but that, but it was actually something for me. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's mine. Ashlyn, um, I'm a granny. <laughs> I'd love to say I'm a student. <laughs> Third year doing medicine, no. <laughs> um, I was brought up in a Christian home, in a very strict brethren home. Um, so I actually gave my life to Jesus when I was about six in, in absolute fear. So I didn't really start my journey um, with the Lord properly as an adult until I'd finished being rebellious um, in my early 40s. <laughs> you really got out of your being system, honest. didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> really got it out. <laughs> I, um, I'm Darren, a husband, a dad, and an electrician. That's it. Um, <laughs> I would say my um, start to know Jesus started when I was 17 and my uh, girlfriend at the time, but who's now my wife, um, he told me about Jesus and told me his testimony and that was the first time I'd ever heard a testimony and that was a start for me, but it wasn't for uh, five years later and five years worth of prayer that I became, made that commitment to become a Christian. But it would say for me it would start when I was 17 hearing what it meant to be a Christian. Awesome. awesome. Very good. Very, very good. Yeah. Wonderful. So Ian started the series uh, talking about the table of decision. I was saying Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. And uh, Ian was saying about, uh, excuse me, choosing the seat at the table, choosing where we'll be, and, and choosing that seat of adoration and worship. So we thought it would be great to get Simon on the panel. We see him here week in, week out, uh, many times leading us in worship. But Simon, I thought it would be great if you could share your heart on worship and how uh, we choose that seat of worship at the table. How important is that decision on our Calvary Road? So, you know, every, every one of us, whether we follow Christ or not, we have an inbuilt thing within us, the desire to worship. Everyone has got that sort of DNA that God has placed within them. And it's up to us to choose what we do with that. We actually worship something 
every second of the day. And it's up to us to choose what that will be. And worship is, I mean, the main definition of worship is, is all about worth. What are you attributing your value to? What do you value the most? What you value the most is what your worship, what your worship will be to. Um, and so I guess my heart is, is to, my, my, my desire is that everyone would have a revelation about how awesome God is um, and to draw them into his presence because he doesn't get half the praise that he, that he deserves. Um, in, in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, there was a big push in the sort of Christian publishing about how worship should be a lifestyle. And it's so true how worship should encapsulate all of our lives 24 hours a day. But throughout that, I think the power and the truth about worship in song and singing has been lost. Um, And we don't actually, we've forgotten the power that there is in singing when we come together on a Sunday. Um, And I think we need to recapture that. Um, Just the the power that there is when we lift up our voices, when we, we make a choice, despite our feelings, when we make a choice based on faith and based on what God's word says, you know, there's over 400 scriptures that reference singing in the Bible. And there's 50 direct commands from God for us to sing to him. Now, he wouldn't give us those direct commands if there wasn't power in song and singing. And so every time that we're on platform here, we, no matter what the uh, atmosphere is like, we want to set the temperature of of lifting up God's voice, uh, lifting up his name and making his name glorious in our city. That the sound of this house would go out through those doors onto the streets and we would make a difference. Your song makes a difference. If we don't sing, the rocks will cry out. The Bible says that all creation cries out to him. There's a there's an awesome video on YouTube that you can watch. It's, it's a guy who's in his garden and he's got some sort of device, I don't know what you call it, but he attaches it to a sunflower and he turns up the, the amp and you can hear the, the song of the, sun, the sunflower, which we can't hear because it's not audible to us. But it's true that all creation cries out to God. Every tree, every plant, every blade of grass, everything is making a sound of praise to God. And I think it's an awesome privilege that we have that we get to sing to him. And yet, I think, if we're honest, we're sometimes so half-hearted with our singing because we're shy or tradition. We have all these excuses sometimes about why we can't sing. But I want to encourage us... um, to make a choice, I'm going to give everything, everything. I'm going to scream my lungs out because he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of it. He went to the cross. He walked that Calvary road for you and me. His back was scourged, scourged. The Bible says he wasn't a beautiful thing to look at. He did that for you and me. And he deserves our song and worship. He deserves our lifestyle of worship, but he also deserves the song that comes out of your heart. Because what comes out of your mouth is from your heart. So if we say that we love God with all of our hearts, if we're not speaking that out, then actually we're fooling ourselves a little bit. Um, And so I want to encourage us, let's make make the choice to worship on a Sunday here. Um, So I pray that some of that encourages you. So good. So good. Yeah, powerful. So, Simon, push that just a thought further. Um, maybe somebody here is saying, well, kind of in my, in my mind, I get that, I agree with that, but personality-wise, I'm just not that kind of hand-raiser, sing-out-loud kind of person. I know you, you, you're more on the introverted end of the spectrum, and how has that journey been for you, breaking through what maybe is your natural personality that isn't to stand on a stage, isn't to sing out, raise hands? How have you broken through that uh, to, the, to now be a worship leader, you know? Um, it starts in your bedroom. It starts in your shower. Uh, it starts when you're stirring soup at the kitchen, at the oven. Um, just sing. Just sing. No one's listening. No one can hear you. God can hear you. But if you're in the house by yourself, just start singing. Kneel at your bed. Lift up your hands. Um, and that's, that's been the journey for me. I mean, I'm, I'm the most introverted person that you probably ever meet. And I married a really extroverted uh, woman, uh, yeah. <laughs> so no, actually, she. 
God put her in my life for a reason to bring me out of my introvertness so that I could lift up my hands, so that I could lift up my voice, so that I could stand on a platform. Because this, you see me on here every week, but this is not where I would choose to be. I haven't chosen to be up here. Um, it's God that's, for some reason, put me here. Um, and it's a privilege for me to do so, but it is totally against what I would classes wanting to do. I would happily sit in a, sit in a corner and observe. <laughs> uh, but that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to, um, to stretch, stretch out your tent uh, and step forward and to fulfill the purpose that he has in you. You've got to walk with him. You've got to trust him. And you've got to step out of your personality because I'm not Scottish and I am actually not an introvert. I've got to change my confession. I'm a citizen of heaven. I am living kingdom culture, not Scottish culture, kingdom culture. And, and just one more point that we want to see heaven on earth. To see that, we've got to start doing on earth what they're doing in heaven. And they are singing their lungs out in heaven. They're bowing before the throne of God and they're singing, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so, yeah, amen. I mean, should we just get the band back up and just <laughs> up and go? <laughs> That's great. So good. Thank you. Thank you. So continuing on that theme, remember in about 10 minutes time, it's over to you, you know, because uh, text in your questions. I'm going to run dry of questions. Thank you for that text. Okay, um, Mary, continuing that thought, uh, we then that evening um, talked about the highway of praise. Uh, I think that was right. Let me get the title. Celebration. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Highway of Celebration. And uh, Craig was sharing about praise and the power of praise and the importance of praise. Uh, I don't know whether you were here last Sunday evening, um, but when Mary, Mary and Izzy, your, your dynamic husband. duo, yeah, your husband, yeah, um, when they lead, they seem to just be able to praise and they just emit praise. And you were leading worship last Sunday and I was watching you and in my heart I said a little prayer and said, God, one day I want to see my girls be able to praise God so freely like Mary did last Sunday and like you do when you lead, but you just have a freedom to praise God. So uh, first of all, could you talk about the difference or, or the distinctives between worship and praise, you know, some of that, and then how do you so freely praise God how you praise him? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, ooh, this is my stab at the difference between worship and praise. So I would see worship as adoration. It's t telling God I love him, you know, telling God that I adore him and then praise is just saying God you're so great you're awesome and thank you for this thank you for that and I just yeah so that would be the distinction I would make <laughs> um, you can't really you know just yeah they're they're just very you know they overlap a lot so we would have on the set list we've got our list of praise songs and our list of worship songs and we tried to pick two praise songs and then two worship am I allowed to say this <laughs> But really, you know, praise should just always be on your lips. It doesn't always have to be a song, you know. Um, and I guess I, it doesn't come naturally to me, I don't think. But it's something that I've just learned I have to do, especially when my circumstances don't seem like what they need to be. I realize, no, actually, I'm not going to let the circumstances be the measure of my truth. I'm going to let God's word um, be the thing that the circumstances have to submit to. So it's by praising God that you're actually lifting him up, you're turning your attention to him, you're fixing your eyes on him, deciding not to worship the circumstance or bow down to the situation. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question That's at so all. <laughs> but um, in terms of exuberance and, mm. and yeah, in praise, um, again, just like Simon says, I just dance and sing around my living room. This is not every day, but it's when I've got the time. I might have like some space when Izzy's not in the house and I just turn on YouTube really loud and just go for it. And I just think I can jump around. No one's watching. Like, let me just go for it. And I've gotten to a stage in corporate worship that I just don't care anymore. I, it, for a long, long time, I really cared what people thought. And there's still a way to go. I've still got a lot to learn. But I've just felt, I just don't care. I just want to meet with God. I don't, 
you know, and I want other people to encounter God. And if I'm not going to go and press in in my worship and my praise, the people that we're leading are not going to get past that point. So good, so good. So describe that journey a little bit about being conscious of others. How, how did you break through? Was it just a matter of time or was it uh, some things that you put in place? I think it was a matter of time, but also just being consistent and pushing myself. And for a long time, when um, Simon and Ailey came back from Australia, we had team nights and they were gradually downloading, you know, vision into us as a worship team. And for ages, I was just, it was just head knowledge and I was just receiving it. And then it's like suddenly it dropped into my heart and just, I just changed my perspective altogether. You know, I realized like what we're doing as a, as a church, even you sitting in the audience, when you worship, like things change in the atmosphere. It's not, it's not just for fun. It's not just a happy, clappy thing we do. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just think that shift happened and I just haven't looked back and I, yeah. Um, so in terms of pushing through, it was very much a, you know, even if I just feel so uncomfortable, I'm gonna lift my hands. Even if I feel so uncomfortable, I'm gonna jump around. Even if I'm the only one in the room looking crazy, I'm gonna do it because it's not for anyone else, it's for God. And it's gonna actually help everyone else come along with me. Um, so it, it has been a lot of, just pushing myself and doing uncomfortable things, doing things I don't really want to do, but I, I see the goal and it gets more and more comfortable. Yeah. And I just do it more and more and it's great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so good. So good. Thank you. That's great. Just before we leave the praise and worship bit, why don't you just do, what, what are some, you know, you guys are, are gifted and anointed to lead us. How can we help you lead us? Maybe, Simon, you want to, like... What if you if you could just you know I don't know whether you can say that. Yeah, yeah if you could wave a wand you know and just everybody would then engage in that way or you know whatever uh, what would be something that we could help you in in leading worship and being part of that? Number one, turn up on time. <laughs> Honestly, wow. if you can't, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Especially third service, please come on time because we're halfway through the worship set and the place is empty and then suddenly at 20 past the place is full mm. um, no excuses for that <laughs> sorry uh, I feel bad for saying that <laughs> have I got the authority to say that we're with you we're with you yeah I don't know if I got the authority to say <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. and yeah and just like I've been saying sing lift your hands Let's forget about ourselves. It's not about ourselves. It's for God. And, you know, it, as Mary said, it becomes easier the more you do it. And, um, and it does change the atmosphere. God inhabits the praises of his people. And the, the Bible says that he is enthroned right. on our praises. And if you look at the scripture, the meaning of it, it means that God actually comes down and he sits. He sits. So he's sitting here with us right now. Mind blown. Yeah, absolutely. Mind blown. Mm. That he would want to come and um, be with us and share his glory with us. That's what it's all about. That's why he created us. He created us so that we could share in his glory. Mm. Um, and so I would really encourage you to, um, to shout the roof off the place. Mm. Let Aberdeen know that Jesus is alive. Yeah. We've got to let them know that he's alive. Mm, mm. If people come in here and they, they don't see that we're a praising church, then how great a God are we actually serving if we're not, if we're not expressing our gratitude and greatness to God? Mm. He's, he's so worthy to be praised and for his name to be lifted up. And I th it, would, it would change Aberdeen if we could get a hold of the power of praise. I really believe that. So good. Great. Sarah's next. We can pass her. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So the next part of the series was the Temple of Consecration. So Jesus had entered into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple. And uh, in their worship, um, the temple has become all about the outward acts, about uh, religion. And uh, we talked about how uh, 
our faith is about relationship and Jesus was so angry at what was going on in the temple because it had just become acts and just things that they were doing when actually what he had come to restore was a relationship. And uh, so Sarah, um, talk a little bit about your journey uh, pre-coming to this church and then coming here and what's the difference has been, what's the Calvary Road been like for you um, on that journey of religion to relationship? Yeah, um, so I think you heard that I got saved in a field um, and that's great, but there was so much more um, around that and around the idea of religion and around the idea of relationship. And um, so I was like, I brought up in a Christian home and we attended church and that was all fine, but it was a very, very, very traditional church. Um, and I'm like not really slagging, I suppose the preaching or anything that was actually said in that church, it was maybe all good, but it was very stuck in its ways and very stuck in tradition. And um, I remember just growing up and I just remember I, w- I stood when I was told to be told to stand and I sat down when I was told to sit down. Um, the idea of opening your eyes during a prayer, why would you do that? That's just ridiculous. Like Things like this that were very just um, stereotypical ways of uh, the church or what the, I suppose what the world views of the church is what my view as a church member was. Um, so I grew up like that for quite a while um, and that was just my perception of church. So religion was this just overhanging term of what was acceptable in church and that's what I believed. Um, and then when I came, I obviously made the decision and was trying to make this pursuit for of Jesus on my own and then I came to Aberdeen and I was like that's great I'm obviously going to find a church that's what I do um but me um was naturally slightly rebellious if you tell me to do something I don't really want to do it naturally um so I was like well I don't really like the tradition so I'll step out of that um so I came to King's one day um and I sat just about round here um, and I remember instantly the music was blaring no offense to worship love it now um but the music was blaring and I instantly was like hate the church don't want to like it like I'm not going to come here um, and was instantly just not like just was already so negative and so not willing to engage with what was going on. Um, and I sat there and like growing up, I was very much like forcing, if it's scripturally right, it's right. So you have to go with scripture all the time. And that's obviously still true and still holds truth and it's still very, I actually really value that part of my upbringing. Um, but I remember sitting and it was Ian um, preaching and I, because the worship was so different to what I was used to, I instantly was like, no way am I going to like the preach. It's going to be like prosperity gospel or something ridiculous. And I like, honestly was just so negative. Um, and praise the Lord, it was not at all. Um, I sat there and I, I always take notes when I'm writing or like listening to preaches. Um, and I sat down and Ian got up and spoke. Um, and before I knew the preach was over, I had eight pages written of notes of my own like interpretation of it and um, everything was going on. Um, and I was so struck in that moment. I was like, God, you actually you must speak in different ways like you must actually work in different places and not be confined to the tradition I had known um and not gonna lie it wasn't a straight off like switch and I was fine I still came back and there was the introduction to the Holy Spirit which was a whole new level of craziness and um I was so scared of it initially and didn't know what to expect um but I actually kind of I suppose realized that um religion wasn't actually what God had called me to and it was a relationship and I'd heard that growing up and I had known that and I was in pursuit of that in my mind um, but I didn't realize that religion almost held me captive um, in my mindset and um, so actually religion isn't just what people see of the church but it's actually your own personal beliefs and what you hold um, and I suppose that's still now I could say that I'm so free from that now and I'm in full pursuit of relationship of which I am but um, religion still does hold captive and you have to I suppose this series has really helped me with that of realizing actually there's some just wee things that you just fall into and you're like actually that's not me pursuing a relationship that's me pursuing religion um, and it's continuously correcting yourself of that and being like you know what actually religion is not worth the pursuit and um, that's not what God died on the cross for and um, so why am I wasting my energy and trying to believe that uh, so kind of then returning to be like actually a much more joyous relationship given um, or given relationship with Christ and that's what we're for so good wow powerful <laughs> talk a bit about um I think, was it two months after you'd started coming, you came to an encounter night Mm -hmm. and encountered the Holy Spirit and you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, What was your your journey there? You understand the Holy Spirit and the difference that being filled with the Holy Spirit has made to your walk now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a riot. Um, It was (laughs) crazy. So I, yeah, came up and there was a, to be honest, I don't, I remember it was about the Holy Spirit. Um, The details, I'm kind of, I was emotionally drained, I think that day. So everything's been wiped, but, 
was called up to the front and I came up um, and I remember it was Leanne that was um, talking to me and she was like, well, Sarah, what do you want? And I was like, I, like, I don't know, but I'm just hungry for God and I just want to know more of God. And um, I don't really know how to encounter that. I didn't know to ask for the Holy Spirit or to ask for that because I still hadn't really quite got my mind around what that was. Um, and she was like, well, have you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? And I just looked at her, I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I, I thought I was, I'm a Christian, like, I love the Lord, I know he died on the cross for me, what is this Holy Spirit thing? Um, and she was like, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you that, like, you'll um, be filled with the Holy Spirit and you receive the gift of tongues. And um, she was like, you just pray as you pray. And I remember thinking in my head, receive the gift of tongues, I sure, whatever, like, like that's not really of God anyway. Um, and kind of just bad it off, it was like, praying and I remember praying being like Lord whatever you have for me I'm going to get it and I'm going to accept it and I'm willing to seek you in this moment and I remember just praying and praying and praying and thinking that Liam was just praying for me and that was really nice and then suddenly I realized that what I was praying wasn't actually English um, and I was like whoa what is going on and it just floods of tears happened and the whole mess like the typical girly mess um, <laughs> and I was just there like completely overwhelmed and um, I remember so afterwards I called my dad as soon as I got out of church and was like, oh, I just got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was just like blank on the phone. Um, and then I was like, I've got the gift of tongues. And he was like, right, Sarah, that's nice, but, but just make sure it's not of the devil. And I was like, <laughs> good. <laughs> and that was his first reaction. So, <laughs> so I think like, I suppose the first start of my journey of the Holy Spirit was a complete, okay, I've got this, is it of God? Panic, 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 is it in scripture? So then of course my natural reaction was to delve into scripture and see that actually fully is of God. And that I had only been experiencing a really small bit of him for a very long time wow. um, and that he had so much more for me and even in that gift of tongues that was what ages ago now but there's still so much more that he can give and so much more so like even if you're sitting in here tonight and you're like oh like I've got the gift of tongues I'm not really sure what actually can be given but there's always always more um, and I didn't know when I came up what I would get I didn't know that God had anything for me and I was kind of just batting it off my head but knew that I wanted God but if you know you want God God's going to give you something no matter whether you know what it is or not and um, so I think that's really good I kind of went off on a tangent I apologize so good so good <laughs> it's really encouraging so good awesome great so we carried on the series the next stop on the journey um, I've forgotten what it was. Here is living room of submission. And um, this is in John 13 when Jesus um, washed the disciples' feet and how he served others in that act of love. And um, just an incredible moment if we picture the room of Jesus serving uh, the disciples by washing their feet. And um, probably somebody that convicts me more than ever, uh, than anyone else, is Darren Shinney in the way that he loves others and gives him his life, him and Georgie, the way they serve others, the way they put a towel on and wash others' feet. So we thought, we've got to have Darren on here uh, to talk about uh, how we serve, love others. And uh, you have three kids, you're an electrician, and uh, how do you uh, make that a priority in your life? How do you balance everything, first of all, um, because you give so much to others. And uh, I guess even in my own life, I think, well, how, how do I get the time for that? You know, how do you guys build it into your life to serve others and love others? Um, <laughs> I think when you mention their submission, I would say it's something I'm not naturally good at. I'm probably the opposite of a guy who submits, to be honest. And I was quite convicted when um, Mary and Simon were sharing there about submitting in praise and worship because it's a complete opposite of who I am and what I do. Like it's not natural, I don't, don't like music, to be honest, I was brought up with my parents, they loved to the rave, so that was my era. So I was no singing, I was no worship, it was just hardcore, like, you know, but we're sharing, but we're on about, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about my evangelism and things, but I think it's important what they're saying here on um, leading others and loving others. And I sat three rows um, back, at the start of the year or maybe the end of last year and Simon was here and he was sharing and he asked everyone to raise his hands and for me if he if Simon tells me that I don't like music so it's an excuse not to like Simon and not to raise my hands you know <laughs> so I will I will not raise my hands and I'm quite rebellious in my spirit and I went and spoke to someone after it and I, it was someone that I thought would agree with me and say you shouldn't be raising your hands if you don't want to raise your hands so I spoke to him and he says no it's a complete opposite son he says, if you want to lead others, you need to be led. And I thought, it's so true. So Simon asked me to raise my hands every week. I'll raise my hands every week. Because the truth is, if we want people in here to feel the love of Christ and feel what it is to be part of a family, how can we be part of that if we are willing to reject our brother and sister telling us what to do? And that was me. And then from that moment, it gave me a release in my spirit. I'm still a horrible singer. I still want to fight Simon every week. But it gives... <laughs> But it gives me a massive release in my spirit to know that I'm 
I love God and there is a release when I raise my hands yeah. because I'm part of something bigger than me. Yeah. You know, I always think it's about telling people in my work and in the street it's about Jesus, but sometimes it's just about being here and being a family and feeling loved. Yeah. So, yeah. so <clears throat> I would say, and answering um, Tom's question there about how George and I prioritize loving people and things. Um, I would always say this and I would say, and I hope he's taking it the right way, I never needed Jesus to love people. I never once needed Jesus as such to love people. It was a gift God gave me, but I never recognized it. You know, as a youngster, about the ages of my kids, they are now my youngest two. My grandma would take me down to town and we were never allowed to turn a shoulder on a person begging on the street. My grandma, two year old, would take me and I would have to sit with the beggars and I would have to speak to them. I would have to find out their stories. Um, and then I grew up a little bit and um, my mum would be exactly the same. She would never turn a person down. If we were driving down a road and there was someone injured at the side of the road, my mum would never have drove past them no matter what was the situation. If it was just me and my mum in the car, she would have got out of the car and made sure that person was okay. You know, we were also brought up and people knocked on our door and where we were brought up, we would have anything from people selling you meat to the gypsies, to anything coming at your door, and my mum would never close the door, she would always invite them in. So we were brought up in that generation, so it was the same as us, my mum and that would then go on to help out in the Cyrenians and help the homeless. So I was brought up into that culture. But you know, that for me, so that just became, before I was a Christian, I would always help out in the Cyrenians, I would always go down the street meeting people. You know, most of the people that were begging on the street, they were mostly my family's friends. My family were caught up in addiction and things. So I knew them all, they just became my mates, you know. And um, so it was what I, it's what I did, but I would say the difference is when I became a Christian, it's who I was. You know, what I did is I was happy. God gave me a gift. I was happy to speak to people. I was happy to exchange. But God changed the whole dynamics of not what I, what I did, but who I became. You know, oh, <laughs> I suppose God gave me the... Thing. I had to be involved in people's lives all the time. You know, I had to be there. I had to, suppose, support them. I had to love them. You know, I've seen so much hurt, so much damage in my own family. And I realized that this was a calling God had called me to be part of people and bring them into our family. God called me to lay down my life for the bigger cause. And the truth is, it's not super spiritual, but I love doing what I do. And that's a truth, Tom. You know, if I ask, and if you ask my wife as well, why do we do what we do? Because we love it. There's, I'm not forced to do it. It's not like Simon saying he's an introvert and he sometimes feels when he's up here. I just, I genuinely love knocking on doors telling people about Jesus. I love going to work and telling people about Jesus. I love telling everybody about Jesus because I know that it can change my life. I know that five pound can help a beggar, but I know that Jesus can give them to like change a life for the rest of their life. Yeah. And I would suppose, Tom, that's why we do what we do. So I guess um, we asked the worship guys, you know, what's something that we could do to help their world? What is something that we could all take? You know, not all of us uh, live in the community you live in or have the, the time or resource or that natural inclination like you do. But what is all something that we could do that you would love to, you know, I feel like you, you um, trailblaze in loving people. You know, you, set, you pioneer a way in showing us how we can all love people. So what is something that we could do practically um, to put on a towel and wash others' feet? Um, two things, I suppose, that would be the same. My grandma would have taught me, and Ian spoke about it when he spoke about Jesus washing his feet, when he gave some points about what Jesus did. He saw things that no one else saw. Yeah. And it wasn't because he was super spiritual. It's because he wasn't in a rush to achieve anything else. Yeah. You know, it was Jesus. He wasn't, a, he wasn't in a rush to make, uh, like, do his job as uh, going out making money. He wasn't in a rush to achieve something else. He was in the moment. And that was it, you know, and that's what my grandma would do. She would never be in town just to get to the shops. She would do there because it was a whole journey to meet people, to go about it, you know. My grandma taught me this and I would still do exactly the same. People would probably, my wife and I would say I'm a bit nuts, but I love walking from where I, in my house and walking into town and things. I do it with the kids and that, but I love just meeting people that are walking along the street, just coming alongside them and asking them their story. And some amazing stories you meet along your road, you know. Some of the great stories, I met a guy and I was sharing a little bit of my um, being a Christian and uh, I was working in this job at, and there was a few guys there and they were all giving me a bit of abuse for being a, a holy willy as they called it. 
Uh, and this is just classic stories I want to come across when you take time out your day. Because as much as it is great about loving Jesus and telling people about Jesus, I genuinely love hearing people's stories. I was brought up around the fishwife's table. So it was stories 24-7 at my grandma's at a weekend while my mom and dad were out raving. And um, <laughs> I went to this guy's house and I knew that it was my moment. He was now engaged. They told him I was a holy willy. So that was now my inroad to tell him a little bit about Jesus. But I was waiting till all the guys that were going to slag me were out of the way and I was going to get in there. So he came in his own ways and he says, I, I'm a, I'm, I believe in God as well. I says, I, fair enough. So I was going to hit him with my Bible and I knew it was better than his. <laughs> so I sat there and we got going and he told me he was, um, he was a Jehovah's Witness. No, he was a Mormon, sorry. So that was a great point. How I became a Christian, how he became a Mormon. So his story was he was brought up in Tilly Drone and... Um, he, there used to be two foreign guys that came in to the town and he was taking all the kids swimming. So they took all his mates swimming, they put them in these weird shorts and they dropped the kids in the swimming pool one by one and they were baptizing him. So he went home that day, told his dad that he was a Mormon. His dad lost the plot, chased the two guys out uh, until they, drone, they were never seen again. So from there, um, he's now written all his application forms since that day up until now that he's a Mormon just because of that instance. Wow. And I love stories like that. They are absolutely <laughs> mental. <laughs> I just... So if you, if you ask why I tell people about Jesus, it's because I want to hear their stories as well. I love stories and I could tell you hundreds more than nuts things like that. Like, and... Um, <laughs> But for me, I would just say, take time out your day and listen to what they've got to say. That's what Jesus did. You look at all the stories, it wasn't that Jesus jumping in. Jesus liked to listen to what they've got to say. Because if you want the answer to their problem, we know it's Jesus, but sometimes they just need a specific avenue to go down. You know, if a guy's got a massive problem with lust, he doesn't want you preaching all this. He wants you to see, give an instance of how Jesus can overcome that thing, but you've got to listen to what the people said. Awesome. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. Jesus did with his people who listened to. And I would say that's what my grandma did. She listened and from listening, you can get an answer. That's so good, yeah. That's very, very good, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Take the mic before there's any more stories, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So we then left um, the, the, the um, washing the disciples' feet and we then went to the Garden of Intercession and the Palace of Rejection. Then begins Jesus' journey of suffering uh, for us. And uh, like Thomas was speaking this morning about facing rejection, how we handle rejection. Last week we were talking about uh, the idea of crushing and pressing and what we do in that, those moments. And when I spoke last Sunday, uh, I came off the stage and Ashlyn um, then reminded me of some of her story and how she'd been through that journey of crushing and pressing. So I thought it'd be great to have you on here. Um, do you want to relay some of that story and then we'll talk about how you journey through that. There's been a few questions coming in about yeah. uh, how do I face difficult times yeah. when it feels too much. So yeah. share I'm not some going to praise mm. you again for your preach if this is how it ends up, me up here. <laughs> uh, it's a long story and I'll cut it short. Um, in 2011, James and I went out to Hillsong um, to study in Australia. Um, and it was an exciting time. We were at Bible college and a leadership college and um, the first six months were just great. There was so much fun, so much learning, um, so many things to soak in and almost like Sarah, so many new things about the worship and the teaching. And then all of a sudden one, one day um, I felt really ill, pain in my arm, pain in my chest, pain in my jaw, never thought anything about it. And um, that was on the Tuesday and then the Saturday it all happened again and we went to the hospital and I had a heart attack. So um, many things went through both our heads at that point because we were thousands of miles away from everyone, um, everyone that we had history with and friendship with. Um, so when we got the diagnosis, our pastor came in and anointed me with oil and immediately I felt a peace. But I also felt that when the doctor gave the diagnosis, I thought, I hear it, but I'm not receiving it. This is just not of the Lord. This is, there must be a reason that, that this has happened so far away. Um, and so those first few days are really scary when you're, you're never, I'd never been in hospital apart from giving birth to my sons. 
And so to be wired up and to have to lie in bed, um, but God had a different reason. He had a reason to have me there um, and to speak into my life because I was choosing to go my own way. Um, although I'd came back to the Lord, gave my life to Jesus the same time as James got saved, I was still determined to go um, my own way. Um, so I would, a bit like the guys are saying, I never spoke out the fact I'm sick or I'm ill. I turned it round every time and said, I praise you, Lord. I don't understand why I'm in this situation. Um, those that know you me, know me really well, you know I, I, I quite like to be smart and to be lying there in a gown when students of 18 and 19 were coming in to visit me was really crushing for me. It was just so blankets up to my chin. I'm like, James, what? straighten my hair, do something with my lipstick, all that kind of things. Um, but all the time, God was, was nudging away, even in the stall, small hours of the night. And I've written something down, if that's okay. It's a verse that, that God gave to me. And at the beginning, I thought, that's a bit harsh. And it's not really a, a verse that we hear a lot of. It's Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. It says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And that was my scripture that I clung on to. Um, and so after about seven days, off I went. Yeah, feeling a bit better. No, back in again, more pain until they, they thought they would try and regulate the medication. Um, and so they decided to do a second angiogram. And, and that's not the most pleasant of things. Um, but we were both anxious because the first report wasn't good. But again, I never ever said my heart attack. I never ever owned that illness and I was keen to speak that out to other patients that I used to toddle about with my drip and do a you in the in the hospital um, but the second angiogram James was in the chapel praying and I got back to bed and messaged him and said you know where are you and the the doctor came up and he said there is nothing wrong with your heart the blockages have cleared there's nothing that we can find. But still, God wasn't finished with me because another four or five episodes of this pain brought me back into hospital. Um, and one day I got an email and a girl from my old church sent me this verse. And I thought, okay, you've got my attention. Um, so that was just a constant crushing and pressing for about six weeks. Mm. And what did it do in you pre, uh, pre that? What was mm -hmm. actually like post? What did the journey do in you? Yeah, completely different. My attitude um, towards lots of, of things changed, especially um, I always had a heart for people, but I never really had the patience. Um, and so while I was in hospital, they, they asked me, I, James brought in some Bibles from Hillsong, and so they asked me why I was going around the different wards with my little trundle and my Bibles. And so eventually I started being the person that would pray for people before they went down for open heart surgery or angiograms and things like that. So um, God definitely did something physically in my heart and spiritually to change my attitude and my mind towards people. Then coming here opened up a whole different area for my life to serve the Lord in a different way. Great. So good. Just wonderful. There's been a couple of questions come in about um, when the crushing and the pressing just keeps on going, you know, like you keep, and you said there you had a miracle story, but then you ended up back in hospital. You know, you kind of celebrate the miracle. You think it's done. God's done it. Uh, how did you keep faith when you thought you'd had your miracle and it was done and you found yourself back in hospital again? Well, as you know, I've got the best looking husband in KCC. <laughs> and, but seriously, he was amazing because um, he would just pray Psalms over me every, every day. He would study um, in, in the hospital with me, but he would pray Psalms over me. Um, they were so gracious. They always gave us a room to ourselves. Um, and they knew that the worship music was always on. So I just, I, at that point, 
dug deeper than I ever have um, to get to know the Lord better in a, in a deeper way. And, and I know he wanted me to do that. But it also brought us together stronger because we did that together. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So good. So good. Well, 727 has gone. Time has gone. There was one more question I thought would really help us. It's just a one-liner or one thought. Somebody texted in saying, what is the importance in raising our hands? So Simon, you want to answer that question because we're about to worship and close. Why should we raise our hands and worship? Because it's a direct command from God. That's the answer. Uh, it says that we should lift up holy hands. We, you've got holy hands. You might not think you've got holy hands because of stuff that you've done, but God pronounces over you that you've got holy hands because you're a child of God. And so, you know, if we do what Scripture tells us to do, and I'm talking to myself here, I'm not just saying, I'm not, by no means got all the answers or perfect with worship or anything like that. Um, but I've got to start doing what God asked me to do. You know, the meaning of worship is, is to bow down. Like, it's not in our culture to bow down, is it? And it's, God's really been challenging me um, to challenge the worship team. Let's be bowing down. Let's have that um, expression of worship to God. Because, they, uh, as I said before, what they're doing in heaven is they're bowing down. And if we want to see heaven on earth and the power of God, then we have to start doing those things, I believe. Um, and God, God will break through. Um, so, yeah, to r raising up holy hands, it's just an act of surrender. Saying that, Lord, I, I surrender all my in 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 inadequacies to you, my attitudes, my motives. I surrender everything to you. Um, and your word says that I should lift up holy hands. So I, here I am, I am lifting up my hands. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Didn't they do well? Let's give them a hand. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for sharing.